let me just distribute so please take one and pass it to your neighbor Oh, okay. So our next lecture is a uh, is another worldwide specialist of random matrices. I would say coming from the statistical mechanics side. This is a uh, Pierre Paolo Vivo, that I'm very happy to. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, that is part of the school. And so I highly recommend uh, so two references. It was asked on the, on the chat. Of course, the book by Marc uh, Potters and Jean Philippe Bouchot that he mentioned. Uh, but also, there are very, very clear and introductory notes by Pierre Paolo that can be found on archive uh that are, that are great so so um what are you going to talk about okay uh can you hear me is everything all right thanks uh thanks very much first of all for uh, for the great uh introductions it's a real thrill to be uh back at ictp for a for a school my last one was in 2017 of course, I spent uh, three years here at ICTP as a, as a postdoc 10 years ago, unfortunately. So this is um, a great uh, comeback. Um, so coming to the uh, topics of the school, uh, I will, of course, talk about uh, random matrices. I will not talk much about random graphs. I will talk about statistical mechanics. I will not talk much about machine learning, but I promise I will mention the word inference at least once during this, this lecture. Uh, actually, technically twice, because I just said it. Um, so um, I have prepared uh, some uh, handouts with some uh, uh, material um, that will be helpful during my, my lectures. And uh, I encourage you to go uh, over the, uh, this material and ask me uh, questions if, uh, if these are not uh, clear. Uh, there will be it's just a collection of material equations formulae that will be helpful during um, during these lectures. Um, I selected a specific class of, uh, of problems um, which I find very very instructive um, that have been uh, most of the, most of these uh, things have been developed at King's where where I am by Jan Fyodorov and uh, his uh, PhD student uh, Rachel Tublin. Uh, I wasn't very much involved in, in, in this during the uh, development of this problem, but we are now coming back to it um, because the, the problem is very rich, it's very instructive. There are a lot of things that we don't know or we don't uh, understand. So I, I thought it would be a, 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 perfect, um, a perfect set of, of problems to, uh, to start with. Um, the, the the problem or the, the class of problems uh, goes under the name of Procrastes uh, problems from the name of the uh, character in, in Greek uh, mythology who was a son of, of Poseidon. He was, he was a rogue and, and a bandit who essentially invited people like strangers over to his, to his mansion. He would force them on uh, uh, on his bed, and then he would proceed by stretching their limbs and, and chopping their legs until they would fit his bed uh, exactly. And unfortunately, nobody would fit his bed, his bed exactly. And, and the class of problems are, um, th they take the name from, uh, from, from this uh, particular um, operation of, of forcing uh, people with, with a constraint on their height into a, a setting where they would not like to, um, to stay. So in the, in the case of the orthogonal procrastis problem, which is depicted in, in, the, in the first figure um, in, the, in the handout, you, you essentially have a set of points uh, A, for example, in the plane, and uh, you rotate 
each of these uh, points uh, rigidly um, to get a new set of uh, points to which you, you add some, some noise. So in the end, you displace the final positions of these points and you get a new set of, of points that we call, that's a triangle, uh, that we call B. So in the orthogonal procrastis problem, you are given uh, the set A, the original set A, and then the set B, which is the rotated set after you've added some noise. And the question that you are asked is how you can, can you reconstruct the best rotation matrix omega that would map A into something as close as possible to the actual set B? Here, the constraint is the fact that the matrix that operates, that, that performs this operation must be a rotation, a rotation matrix. Uh, in the oblique U procrastis problem, which is the, the one that I'm, that I'm dealing um, with uh, here, we are instead given uh, a set of uh, equations, so a linear set of equations with a nonlinear constraint. So the setting is, uh, is as follows. Uh, you are given a matrix uh, A, with M rows and N columns. This matrix uh, A uh, is applied to a vector X to give uh, a vector B. So this is the linear system that we want to, uh, to solve. The vector B is uh, a vector with M uh, entries, a real vector with, with M entries. And we have a constraint though on X, on the solution of this uh, linear system, that is that the modulus square of X must be equal to a constant, let's call it uh, N. So X lives on, on a sphere. This is a quadratic constraint, but uh, it, it must be a solution of this uh, linear system. In the, in the Procrastus uh, setting, X is the poor uh, passerby, the, the person that is invited by Procrastus in that satisfies this, this constraints on, on his normal height. He doesn't want to be stretched or, or to have his, his legs chopped. A is Procrastus hammer and B is Procrastus bed. So we want to act on something that, that has a, a, a constraint in such a way that it fits um, another, uh, you know, an, another location, which is, is, is bad, okay? How to uh, analyze this, uh, this problem? So M is number of rows, N is the number of columns. So in, in this uh, linear system setting, M is the number of uh, equations and N, is the number of uh, variables. We will start with considering the case M larger than N, but we will also relax this, this assumption. So we will get results also for M smaller than, uh, than uh, N. So how uh, do you measure the, in, in general, of course, uh, for a given uh, instance, so you want to find the solution X of this, of this problem. Uh, in general, this system of equation will not have uh, a solution, okay? So how do we measure whether this system, whether we are approximating the solution in a good way or in a bad way? Well, we uh, introduce a utility function or a loss function. Let's call it H of X, um, defined, for example, in terms of the square norm of the difference. So when, when this uh, square norm of the difference is exactly equal to zero, then the system has a solution. If this square norm is larger than zero, then in general, we are not able to solve this, this system, but this is a measure of how good we are performing in approximating the solution to this, uh, to this system, okay? So this is a loss function that can also be written explicitly in terms of the uh, components. So K from one to M, and then we have summation over J from one to N. 
a k j x j minus b k squared. And uh, we will consider a randomized version of this, uh, of this problem to understand questions of typicality, like what is the typical behavior of the system. So we will take A, the entries of, of the matrix A, and B, the entries of the bed vector as random, random variables. So um, A, K, J will be Gaussian random variables, which makes clearly the cost function a uh, random function for which we can, we can compute the statistics of interesting uh, observables. And BK is Gaussian uh, as well. So all the entries are Gaussian with the following um, covariance uh, structure. So they are IID with variance, uh, with variance sigma square. Okay, so this is the, uh, the setting. And given this is uh, M, N, and sigma square, we are interested in two objects. The first one is the statistics of the critical point. I will tell you in a minute what critical points are. And then the second point is the statistics of the minimal loss. The minimal loss is zero if, if the system can be solved. It is larger than zero if the system cannot be solved, but still we would like to, to understand how close we, we are to solving the system exactly. Okay. Now, this, uh, this problem can be uh, tackled by uh, using the Lagrange multipliers uh, method. So we uh, define a Lagrangian that depends on X, which is equal to our loss function to which we add uh, a constraint on the norm of the, vector, uh, of the vector X. So we want the norm to be equal to uh, N. So this, this object, the solution must live on, on a sphere. And then what we need to do is we need to find the critical points of this uh, Lagrangians, Lagrangian. So the, the solution in, in components, we need to take the derivatives with respect to X uh, R of the, the Lagrangian and in particular, and set this equal to uh, zero, okay? Uh, yeah, sorry. This, this by by this symbol, I mean the. Uh, so this is equivalent to the square norm of the vector of the vector x. So this this stands for the dot uh, dot product of the vectors x. Okay. So if you take this uh, this object here and you differentiate this object with respect to x r then you get a factor of two that comes, that comes down, and then you, you get uh, a, a factor uh, that multiplies x, x, r coming from, from here, right? So what you, what you get by differentiating it is one half times a factor of two. Then you get the summation over k of this object squared, which is summation over j, a, k, j, x, j minus b, k. And then you get uh, an extra factor differentiating inside here, which is AKR. Minus lambda over two times two XR equal to zero. Okay. 
So this goes away. And now you can recast this equation for the critical, for the critical points of this loss function in matrix, matrix form. So you get precisely AX minus B here. And then you get, sorry, there is no two here. And then this object here is multiplied to the left by A transpose, because you get this term here that is summed over K. So you get A transpose times AX minus B, which must be equal to lambda X. That's the equation for the critical points. And we can proceed by multiplying this A transpose in. So we get A transpose A minus A transpose B applied. So A transpose A X minus A transpose B which must be equal to lambda x. And now I move x to the left. So I get a transpose a minus lambda identity that multiplies x must be equal to a transpose b. So a transpose a uh, has been, I mean, we, we discussed this with, with Mark, but, and I thank him for um, help, helping me out a lot here. So A transpose uh, A, remember A is a rectangular matrix, uh, N times N. So this is precisely the V-shirt matrix corresponding to the matrix A. So let's call it uh, W. So the solution to my uh, problem, to finding the critical points of this lost constrained loss function is that X must be equal to W minus lambda identity to the minus one applied to A transpose B. Okay. Now, which is, if I'm not mistaken, the, the solution of the standard uh, ridge regression also, right? Uh, I, I guess uh, that's the case, yes. But don't take my words. Yeah, this Sorry. is the solution of regularized uh, ridge regression. I, I think, I, I, think it, I think it yeah. must be, but yeah. uh, I, I was hesitant to to make a statement of this type. But thanks for jumping in. So now we have uh, a, this solution. We we are still missing something, right? Because we have a constraint that x must must live on the sphere. So we need now to impose the constraint that x lives on the sphere which fixes the Lagrange multiplier, okay? So what we need to do is we need to compute X transpose X. And if we compute X transpose X, we need to transpose all this, uh, this term starting from the right. So we get B transpose A, and then we get W minus Lambda identity to the minus one, but then there is an X, so this becomes to the minus two applied to A transpose B. Okay. And this object here must be equal to N, our constraint. This is just a number. If you, if you analyze all the sizes of, uh, of the matrices and vectors involved, this is just a number. And this, this equation fixes the value for the Lagrange multiplier uh, lambda, okay? Now we need to work on this, on this bit here. A, okay? So first of all, here we have one over W minus lambda I to the power two. And I claim that this object can be expressed in a series which is k plus one w to the power k divided by lambda to the k plus two. I will not prove this, but what uh, you, you prove it by 
taking minus the derivative with respect to lambda of one over lambda identity minus w, and you uh, expand this object in a standard geometric series. So this is our first ingredient. And then we have a second ingredient, which is, uh, you see, if we plug this object in, in here, what we will have to deal with is something like A, W to the K, A transpose. That's the kind of elementary object that we have to deal with. So A, W to the K, A transpose, we can write it as A, what is W? It is A transpose A, A transpose A, K times, multiplied by A transpose, okay? I'm, I'm just expanding the, the power K of the, of the Wishart. And now I can regroup these terms starting from A, and I get A, A transpose, A, A transpose, A, A transpose which is what, uh, what Mark discussed. Uh, we have A, A transpose, A, A transpose, uh, a number of times, K plus one times. So this is W A raised to the power K plus one. What is W A? W A is the uh, anti wishard let's call it the anti wishard matrix. So if, if the Wishart matrix is n by n, the anti Wishart matrix is m by m, where m is larger than n in general. Okay. Good. So now we, um, we are able to massage a bit this, this term here, this constraint. So for this constraint, we have that A W minus lambda identity to the minus two, A transpose can be written as a sum over K of K plus one over lambda to the K plus two, A W to the K A transpose. This one using the property number two is K plus one divided by lambda to the K plus two anti wishart matrix raised to the power k plus one. Okay. And now we can refold this, uh, this sum into this uh, form. anti wishart divided by lambda identity of size m minus anti wishart to the power two. I'm just rereading this uh, the, the first property from right to, to left. Okay. And now we have an expression that depends on the anti Wishart uh, matrix that has the same eigenvalue, the same non zero eigenvalues as the original matrix N plus a number of zero eigenvalues M minus N. So it is natural now to perform a spectral decomposition and try to rewrite this object in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the anti Wishart matrix which is to say of the Wishart matrix as well, okay? So if we do that, um, and this, I think the spectral decomposition here is uh, on, on page one of the, uh, of the handout also. So I spell it, uh, I, I'm not doing the full derivation, but essentially, everything can be written in terms of the n non-zero non eigenvalues of the anti wishart uh, matrix here, times the decomposition in terms of the projector, projectors over the uh, i uh, eigenspace. So if you're not familiar with the Brian cat notation, this is just, you know, column vector and, and row vectors, nothing. Uh, nothing more fancy than that, okay? So now what we have is this object here that needs to be plugged in, in here, in the constraint. So what we get is 
that x transpose x is summation i1 to n si divided by lambda minus si square. So si's are the eigenvalues of the Wishart matrix or the non-zero eigenvalues of the anti wishart matrix. And then we have B, B, I, B, I, B. So here we have the, we are projecting the eigenvectors of the Wishart matrix over the vector of the Procrustes bed. Okay, the, the, the known term of the, of the linear system. And of course, uh, this term here is nothing but uh, B transpose BI squared. It, it, is just a, it is just a number here. It is just a, a coefficient uh, here in this expansion. It, it is a random number, of course, that depends on the randomness in the Bs. Yeah? For, no, for non-mathematician, this bracket notation is... Uh... Yeah, it is... It, it, it is just a column vector and, and the row vector, yeah. which is, I mean, the, this one you can interpret as a, as a dot product here and the dot product there. So, and these two terms are identical. So this, this gives essentially the square of, of, this, uh, of this number. Okay, so if we know that B is a Gaussian, uh, uh, Gaussian vector with variance sigma square, so we can write that B is sigma times psi, where psi is uh, uh, zero, one. So each components of psi are, are zero, one. And, uh, and so if we, if we replace this notation in here, we get the important point. So let me highlight it in purple. So we have that um, over i from one to n si divided by lambda minus si squared. Um, psi transpose vi squared must be equal to n over sigma squared. So I pulled out a sigma square from, from here and I put it there. So this is an equation for the Lagrange multiplier lambda. Okay, that depends on the eigenvalues of the Wishart matrix corresponding to the uh, matrix of coefficients of our linear system. And it depends on the noise of the procrastinian bed. Okay, the terms, the, the known terms of the equation. Good, so let's uh, now try to analyze uh, a bit this uh, equation for the constraint. So let me just stress that constraints in this problem, this nonlinear quadratic constraint is extremely important. It, it, changed, it changes the entire physics of the, of the problem, okay? So the presence of a nonlinear constraint in a linear system changes the, changes the physics of the problem entirely. Uh, is everything clear? If there are questions, just stop me now or the problems might start snowballing. Okay, so let's, let's try to uh, draw a sketch of this function. Let's call it phi of lambda as a function of uh, the Lagrange multiplier, the, the left-hand side here for a fixed realization of our uh, disorder. So for a fixed realization of our eigenvalues, the eigenvalues of Wishart are positive, remember, or non-negative. So the situation is as follows. We have uh, a set of locations for the eigenvalues of our Wishart matrix. The Wishart matrix obtained uh, from the uh, known coefficients of our uh, of our matrix 
here we have lambda, here we have phi of lambda. So you see that uh, this function on the left has poles at every location of the uh, eigenvalue. So it will diverge every time we hit uh, an eigenvalue of Wishart, okay? Except at the beginning here. And then we will have like some sort of parabolic uh, quadratic behavior here, whose depth uh, depends on the, so, so the, the depth of these uh, minima depends on the coefficients uh, here, which are, which are random, okay? So what happens is that this uh, uh, object here, this function g of uh, phi of lambda must be equal to a constant n over sigma square. But this constant changes, the level changes depending on the noise of the bed. So we need to draw a line here, a horizontal line. And the number of intersections of this line with, with this curve corresponds to the number of real Lagrange multipliers that are satisfying the equation for the uh, critical points of my, loss of my constrained loss function. This line is at position n over sigma square. Okay. So when the noise becomes large, uh, this line goes down. Okay. And at some point, uh, the number of Uh, hits the number of, of matches that you are that you are finding decreases as the noise increases up to a point where you will have only two solutions here. Okay. So there are typically uh, zero or two solutions between every pairs of eigenvalues. So zero or two solutions apart from the, the critical limiting case here. And the number of solutions of the critical uh, equation changes with the noise. So for sigma going to zero, we typically have two n solutions corresponding to, to these, these points here uh, on, on either side of, of an eigenvalue. For very large noise, only two solutions will survive. So if we plot the number of solutions as a function of sigma, what we will get is a, a, staircase, a staircase type of uh, behavior that starts from 2n and then decay up to a point where for, for very large sigma, only two critical solutions uh, survive, okay? This is what uh, in, in, a, in, in the literature in a somehow, somewhat uh, fancy way is called a gradual um, topology trivialization. It means that when you increase the, the noise, the topology of your, of your space trivialize, trivializes from a situation where you have two n critical points. And remember, we are counting all critical points. We are not just counting minima. We are counting minima, saddle, and maxima of your, of your loss, loss function. But for small noise, we have a, a rough landscape with a lot of critical points. When, when the noise uh, increases, then you gradually lose complexity in your, in your landscape until only two of them, a minimum and a maximum uh, survives, okay? This gradual topology trivialization is, uh, you know, it has uh, several uh, consequences. And of course, when you, uh, when you, this is just for one realization of your disorder, if you average over, uh, many such matrices A and many vectors Xi, what you expect is that this staircase will, will smoothen and you will get something like, you're expecting to get something like this, a smooth, a smooth curve. 
that describes the topology trivialization. So this, this problem is one of the few examples where this smooth curves, curve can be computed uh, exactly, not only that, but also for finite M and N. So this is one of the, the few cases where um, this, uh, the, the full landscape of critical points can be characterized analytically for finite M and N. So without any large N approximation. And uh, between now and uh, now, I will try to essentially um, describe how to uh, sketch this, this calculation. Now, uh, the question is, of course, is this something that we are very much uh, interested uh, in? This is not the best thing that we, we would like to compute, right? What we would like to compute is the statistics of the minimal loss or the statistics of the critical points grouped by type, minima, saddles, and maxima. Unfortunately, this is a, a, an order of magnitude more complex uh, problem for which we don't have any analytical uh, handle. So at the moment, we are totally unable to compute the statistics of critical points by type. So dividing the minima from the saddles and from the maxima. That, uh, that, is, um, that is something we are unable to do. Yes, yes, uh, and, 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 and averaging over the disorder. Okay. I mean, the, the staircase is, of course, for a given instance, for a given realization. The average, you can compute it uh, for finite n and m, but this includes all critical points, not, not, just, not just minima. Okay. Uh, concerning the minimum, uh, I just mention one thing and then we, we start. Um, there is a, a theorem uh, which helps us. Uh, it's a theorem by Brown in uh, 1967, which, uh, which states that for this loss function, for the loss function defined by uh, h of x that I gave at the beginning, uh, there is uh, uh, a chain of, uh, so inequalities are preserved between the uh, Lagrange multipliers and the value of the loss function. So, so if, if you pick uh, va values of the Lagrange multipliers that are solution of this, uh, uh, to this equation, and they are sorted, then the corresponding loss function at, evaluated at, that, at those solutions um, are exactly in the, same, uh, in the same relationship. So smaller Lagrange multipliers correspond to smaller loss functions. And if this is the case, then of course uh, the implication is that the minimum value of the loss function uh, is obtained in, in correspondence of the minimal value of the Lagrange uh, multipliers, which is this one. Okay, so this, this uh, solution is the most important one because it gives the minimal uh, loss, loss function. Whether this is zero, of course, it means that the system is compatible. If it is larger than zero, it means that the system is not compatible, but how far we are from, from full compatibility is determined by this, by this number. Okay, so the minimal loss is obtained uh, here where X min is, uh, I hope I, yeah, of course I erased it, but X min is W minus Lambda min identity to the minus one applied to A transpose B. That, that was the formula for the solution of the critical point that I gave you a few minutes ago and then erased. So we will not use this uh, now, but we will use this, uh, this uh, later. So we have a precise characterization of what is the minimal uh, vector, I mean, the argmin of the loss, loss function in terms of the minimal um, uh, Lagrange multipliers, which, which sits here. 
Sorry? The minimum? Yeah. No, it changes sign actually. And you, you can see you can see from here, you can, you can characterize the point at which uh, it changes side using um, um, mean field type of argument, like a self, um, self averaging property essentially. So it, it, it does change sign and, uh, and, but once you plug it in here, everything, you know, everything is taken care of by the, by the final formula. Okay, uh, any other question? Yeah. But I, I absolutely have no idea, but um, maybe, yes. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't know, I don't know enough about that to answer this, but probably, maybe yes, I don't know. Sorry. Anything else? Yeah, okay. The, the Lagrangian multiplier is negative or positive. Okay. Well, uh, the what what changes? Uh, I mean, we we need to have. I mean, we are going to see a, a precise solution to this uh, to this problem in um, like tomorrow. So maybe we can wait until then to just discuss because we we will have a precise expression for for the minimal loss and for the corresponding. Uh, Eigen, eigenvalues. So maybe maybe it's it's just a bit premature. I, I prefer to just um, go over the, the rest and then get to the final expression, so we can we can study exactly what happens when when you when you change signs with the expression in front of in front of us. Okay, if, if you don't mind. So can you say one word about this monotonicity property? Because it seems very strong. I mean, that the Lagrange multiplier implies that the- Yeah, energy... I mean, the, uh, the, the, the proof is very technical and it is specific for this, for this type of, uh, uh, of uh, loss, loss function. So I don't think it, it extends um, or it is a general, it is a general um, feature. Um, I, I, don't have, I don't have a very strong intuition because oh. the-, the, the the proof is based precisely on this quadratic uh, quadratic loss function and 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 its constraint, its associated constraint. So it, it requires some some convexity argument that only applies to this type of uh, uh, of loss function. So uh, it, it is true that it is a very strong strong property. I I, I don't know how general it is. Uh, in uh, in uh, in this paper, it is specific. So it heavily. Uh, hinges on on this specific form of the loss function. So, um, and there is no sort of heuristic that uh, could explain it. I couldn't I couldn't find one. And, okay. uh, and uh, but it, it, we are lucky that 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 we've got it because we, we have <laughs> yes. an analytical handle on on the minimum. But uh, it, it is it doesn't seem to be very general. It's uh, it's a, it's an accident that makes this problem. Um, so rich and, and lucky. So in, in machine learning term, this, this cost function would represent the training error in this ridge regression problem. And so this Brown theorem tells you that you should look for, in order to minimize this training error, you should look actually for small regularizations, mm -hmm. which I didn't know it's-, uh, it's um, yeah. yeah, but, but uh, exactly. But it's not a, gen, it's not a very general yes, problem, yes. Uh, property. So- Um, what happens to the uh, red box when n is really large? Because I expect that scalar product to have some self-averaging properties. And uh, as, I, as I've heard um, five minutes ago, maybe that scalar product converges to one or something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the question is very, is very interesting. And even more interesting is uh, the fact that the right hand side depends on this combination n over sigma square, right? So uh, what we are going to do is everything at finite n essentially, or in, in a large n limit so that this term is not known problematic. But of course, uh, this, this term might have different behavior and the solution to this, to this equation might have a very different behavior depending on how sigma square actually scales with n. 
So not only we have a, we have a problem of how n goes to infinity, but we have a problem of how sigma squared the noise scales with uh, scales with n. So there is a, unfortunately we will not have uh, have time to discuss all the different regimes, but uh, but Jan in his paper discusses uh, discusses very different regimes depending on whether sigma is of order one or of order one over n. And, uh, and, and this creates, I mean, the, the large and limit of this equation is very different in the two cases. In, in general, what, what, what you have is that this uh, trivialization does not survive necessarily the large and limit. So in, uh, in a wide range of, of regimes, uh, you will get a tri trivialization that is almost immediate. So you will essentially to the situation where you only have a minimum and a maximum always in the large and limit. The, the trivialization is, is a property of the of a finite n uh, of a finite n prob problem. So why do you actually call the sigma square noise? Because I see B as the solution that you're looking for. No, X, uh, to, is, the, uh, X is the solution. Sorry, as the constraint that you're the, the, the the, the constraint that you are enforcing, but wh why would you call sigma square noise? I don't. Um, I mean, uh, maybe 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 it's not it's not the best choice of uh, of words. But uh, in in the context of the orthogonal procrastes, I think the the term is appropriate because if you remember, you had a, a set in the orthogonal procrastes, which is analog of of this one. You had. Uh, a set of points A that you would rigidly rotate into another set, and then you would add some perturbation. And, and at the end of this operation, you are given the, the result. So clearly calling this noise is very, very appropriate because if the noise is very large, the final points are very far from the from the from just the final point of the of the of the rotation. Nice right. Theory. So so that um, that is why I'm I'm referring. Uh, to it as as noise. How much time do we have? A uh, few minutes, maybe, or it's over. Well, let me just uh, let me just give you uh, the technical bit that we are going to use. Just a formula, and then we go for um, lunch. Yeah. Uh, so. I just wanted to show you how we would compute uh, this uh, average uh, number of uh, critical points for finite M and N, because um, th there is a lot of technical machinery that might be useful to you. And well, who knows when, when one of these tricks might, be, uh, might, might come handy. Um, so to compute this, uh, uh, this average uh, curve, we will make use of uh, the so-called uh, cat's rice uh, formalism, uh, which is also uh, summarized in the handouts, formula three. So the cat's rice uh, formalism uh, allows to compute, so that the setting is we have a set of equations in uh, k variables. And um, a system of k equations in k unknowns may have many solutions. And the number of isolated uh, solutions in the domain is given by the cat's rice formula, which is n of d is what? Is an integral over x1 xk over the domain d of what? Well, you have delta f1, delta of fk, and then you have the absolute value of the determinant of dfi dx. Okay. So the uh, the formula looks complicated, but essentially, if you look at it, uh, it's quite should be quite obvious. These Dirac deltas uh, take care of the fact that f one and f k must be a solution of this of the system, so they must be equal to zero. 
And this is the absolute value of a determinant. So this is a Jacobian of, uh, of a transformation and the absolute value is, is crucial. Um, the, the proof of it is, uh, is difficult, but in one dimension, it's, uh, it's a bit more heuristically, it's a bit more uh, obvious. Mm, so imagine that you have a function. So let me throw it. Uh, function of a single, single variable. And uh, you have uh, a certain level u, and you want to find the number of solutions of this function f of t equal to u in a certain domain uh, b. So what, what you, would, uh, you would do to compute this object, well, you would, you would set a certain variable v equal to u, you would integrate over the variable v, and you would uh, enforce that v is equal is inside your uh, domain and if you put v equals to f uh, of t uh, you would get essentially the integral over dt f prime of t delta of f t minus u in the domain d So essentially, the Katz-Rice formalism in k dimension is the extension of this, the uh, solution uh, of this simple problem in one in one dimension. And you should not forget to include the uh, this Jacobian Jacobian term here. Okay. So what we are going to do is uh, we are going to try to write this Katz-Rice uh, integral for our problem, and then try to average this. Uh, this integral over the disorder. The disorder is given by A, the matrix of coefficients, and the matrix of uh, known, known terms, so A and B. And, uh, and, and so there is, uh, there is quite a, a, a lot of work to do, but these averages can be performed exactly in this problem for finite M and, uh, and N. Okay, and in, in the course of the, of the next lecture, we will learn a few techniques on, on how to compute this type of, uh, of averages. Okay, I'm done. Any, any questions? We should restart at four and we can have lunch just above there. Uh, at four, sorry, at two, <laughs> two p.m. <laughs>